Heartland. We just heard from uh, the first of three authors today. We heard from Mark Scott Smith, who just wrote Enemy in the Mirror, Love and Fury in the Pacific War. And now we're talking to a couple of other friends. It's a total literary Heartland show today. The, uh, we're going to talk with Russ Bradbird, who is familiar to some of our regular listeners, about his Make It, Take It book. But uh, first we're going to welcome Michael Lenahan to the stage, whose book Ramblers, Loyola, Chicago, 1963, the team that changed the color of college basketball. I'm going to start by saying welcome. Thank you very much. Nice welcome to be here. Welcome and good morning. Good morning. And um, Michael, right off the bat, I read in the, um, in the preface of your book, you, you sort of, it was like you decried the subtitle. He said, no, we didn't really change the color of college. But will you explain what you wrote there in that preface? Yeah. Um, it was, a, it was interesting. First of all, uh, I want to dispel the notion that somebody forced that subtitle on me. I, I came up with it all by myself. Okay, I that's what I wanted to know. I responsibility. <laughs> uh, but uh, as I try to indicate in my forward, this kind of book always changed the, uh, whatever the author is writing about change the course of human history <laughs> uh, so that uh, you know it's um, the Magic Johnson Larry Bird game uh, according to Seth Davis's book uh, you know change the world forever and it it's just kind of obligatory to make this kind of claim on the cover of so the book. So hyperbole is okay when you write it yourself. It's, it's mandatory hyperbole, <laughs> and especially if you apologize for it a few pages later. There I you think go. That's, <laughs> that's what I like. Well, I, I really love the book, I gotta say, you know, and I, I love Russ's book too. I think that your new book, The Ramblers, and Russ's book, 40 Minutes of Hell on Nolan Richardson, really talk tell the story of civil rights through basketball in this country. Um, we also like Loyola, they're a local team, and we happen to have in front of the Heartland some of the uh, bleachers that came out of the old alumni gym. When Gordon Thompson Actually uh, true. was building a track up there, we got all this old bleachers. Now the wood From has changed, picture. but the frames are there. Okay. And uh, we sit on it all the time, and we remember the 63 team. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the book really, uh, your book, goes into, uh, follows three teams, Mississippi State, Cincinnati, and Loyola. Right. And the recruiting and the networks and the, uh, the issues, issues around race, issues around class, money, uh, the politics of each state, uh, you know, the integration and the attempted integration by Meredith down in Mississippi, of, Uni of University of Mississippi. Um, talk a little bit about what influenced you and what uh, drove you to, to create this book. Okay, well, I, I see you read the book. That's great. I'm, I'm <laughs> and I didn't have a real question there. <laughs> Just um, I'm not all that much of a basketball guy. Uh, what pulled me to this story was the civil rights and integration aspect of it. And uh, the basketball is a very handy uh, device uh, on which to hang that stuff because the season has a natural arc, it's got obstacles to overcome, it's got a resolution at the end, it's all the things that a storyteller wants. Uh, and into the uh, spaces between that story you can cram a lot of uh, history and information about uh, uh, civil rights and uh, the integration not only of the country but also of uh, basketball and the way the black players influenced the style of play and uh, the game that we know today you know back uh, at the time when most of these guys in at, on the 63 Loyola team were in high school uh, most players were being taught by coaches to pass and move around and uh, uh, play in the, the, a style that one coach described to me as horizontal, it's on the floor. Right. Uh, but when the black players started coming into the game, they uh, brought a new dimension to it, and uh, you know, we see the result today, today. in the mega NBA and uh, all the money and excitement that that uh, generates. So that's the part of the story that uh, really appealed to me. and. Uh, I was just lucky. I, I, uh, I, w I saw uh, a little flashback show on Channel 11 that 
brought out a little bit of the racial dimension of this story. And I went looking for the book that I was sure I would find. And it didn't and I exist. And I didn't find it. So wow. four years later or something, here we are. So this, this is the result of a segment on Chicago Tonight, probably. I think so. Yeah, which I, I still maintain is one of the best Chicago news programs on TV, Chicago Tonight. But um, I love that, one, you, didn't, you weren't a basketball guy. And you put it in that framework, and using a tool that I'm sure Russ discovered a long time ago, that beginning, middle, and end to it all, that basketball framework can give you. Although yep. Russ has included things like fiddle playing and thrown in a few other, but you both throw in politics, so it's one of the reasons Michael is well, one of the so things that, uh, taken by it. That really has hit me. You know, I've known Russ for a good amount of time and participating in basketball in the bar. We were both on the board of Athletes United for Peace, and um, one of the things that uh, I learned from Russ was about uh, the UTEP team uh, and Haskins, the coach. And uh, Russ was the uh, an assistant coach there. He always says he made more money as an assistant coach than the the head of the English department. Uh, mm. And he, uh, you know, the UTEP team was the first team of all blacks to win the NC2A, and I think that would have been 64, 66, 66 uh. Uh, against an all-white Kentucky team. But then when I heard the story that t takes place in Mike's book about the Loyola team right. in 63, which had three black starters at the time, uh, playing, uh, finally playing in the during the NCAA champion, 2A championships uh, against Mississippi State, who had to sneak out of the state. Now, UTEP has a movie made about them in Glory Road. Uh, I don't know why there isn't a movie yet about this, the Loyola team and that stuff. A Maybe there will Loyola, be. A lot of the Loyola players have said the same thing to me. Where's our movie? Are you gonna, are you gonna try and get a screen? A script out of this? Every writer. I'm wants accepting it. Uh, all inquiries. <laughs> <laughs> I know Good. one director. I'm sending both your books, all your books, to this guy. All right. <laughs> so, Russ, let's talk about your book a little bit. Uh, you know, you've been on this show uh, a number of times, uh, whether it's about Athletes United for Peace, Basketball in the Barrio, Patty on the Hardwood, or your book about Nolan Richardson. Um, this is your first uh, kind of novel, really. For, first. Mike, I'd like to say I'm, I'm about two-thirds of the way through this, and it's fabulous. This is a really the great book. The Ramblers, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and Mike says, you know, Mike, you say that, uh, well, no single event changed the game, but this book, I think, will change the way people think about Loyola and their place in history, but, but also, I think, what sort of what's possible in uh, sports journalism. You know, I think it's an important aspect that he's not a basketball guy. He comes in it with fresh eyes and really sees a story that, that people haven't told before. And, and the writing is just really terrific, Mike. So not to, not to go backwards to 1963 again, uh, but, but there it is. Yeah, so I'd say... What's your next going to be congratulations, about? Congratulations. Uh, art, art and stuff? I don't, a basketball guy writing I don't about know. something I'm else? Just, I'm just wanna, I just want to finish Rambler before I do anything else. So. <laughs> I, I, you know, as usual, Russ, your, uh, your generosity to a fellow writer is duly noted um, and appreciated as somebody who has not... I've, I've only just begun Ramblers, um, but I was at Mundelein College in 68, which was not that long after, and I had friends on the basketball team. Um, uh, I, I'd name names, but uh, great tall guys who were, it was a mixed race team, of course, by then as well, and, um, and I loved them for that because I had come from the southwest side where rampant you know, uh, racism was going on it, at the exact same time that your book was occurring. And there were kids at Loyola who came from that. So, and there was a guy on this 63 team who came from that. Which, which guy? From Jack Egan, the one oh, white yeah. starter on the team, was a guy from Marquette Park. And he tells some harrowing stories about the way his teammates would have been treated had they been seen walking through his neighborhood. Exactly, exactly. And that that's so key that you, you chose this, that this moment in time existed. It's, it's, there's a lot of reverberations. So I'm saying amen to what you said, Russ. Yeah. And 
and I still have to finish the book myself. Well, I think I think what what Mike gets at in Ramblers is it's it's a, it's a complicated story, and it's not as simple as this changed the world. But right. there, you know, there's uh, the, just the way the players interacted with George Ireland, and Ireland was a complicated figure. Yes, he, wasn't, he was. You know, in the Glory Road movie, which I think is actually a terrible movie, uh, they, they you know Haskins gets painted as this saint and hero, which is not at all true. And I think Mike gets to that point pretty quickly uh, in Ramblers that it's that it is complicated. And there's while there are some heroic things done by ordinary people, it's, they're they're complicated guys. And to me, that's a better story. Yeah, yeah, that's the depth. Yeah. Russ, tell us a little bit about your book. Uh, what's it, it's a it's kind of interesting to me. It's a collection of uh, sort of short stories that have a theme and similar people running through them. Uh, this was something I know you've been working on a while, and you had uh, just got published by Cinco Puntos, your friend in the mind, Bobby Bird, and uh, it was a great read. Yeah, well, uh, the idea was sort of a novel and stories. There's a long tradition in American literature of, of great writers, better writers than I am, but from Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio, Joyce's Dubliners, and most recently, uh, Olive Kittredge, uh, by Elizabeth Strout and, and uh, Lost in the City, the great uh, Edward P. Jones collection of short stories that are linked. So uh, the idea of a linked story collection is not a, not a new one, so, and I think it can be read as a novel or a short story collection, but I'm, I was trying to do, you know, I think Mike and I had very similar interests in that I was trying to get to the story, you know, under the story, get behind the scenes of college basketball and, and show what it's really like and what was really going on. I think, you know, Americans have a strong fascination with college sports and they want to be in the know they want to know what really happened can I ask a question about uh, we're all up here to Russ's book please do um, Mike I think your character Steve Pytel is really fascinating and uh, uh, just to uh, summarize a little bit he's a coach in a division one program trying to hold on to his job assistant coach, assistant coach. He works for a coach who can only be described by a seven-letter word that begins with A and ends with E. <laughs> um, Got it. He's struggling Check. to keep his he's struggling to keep his marriage intact, and he seems to have pretty much forgotten, or almost forgotten. He's just on the verge of forgetting why he wanted to be a coach in the first place. Nicely so, done, Mike. So this makes me want to ask the former Division One assistant coach. And uh, great recruiter. Why did you want to be a coach, and why did you stop wanting to be a coach? Well, I, yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting question, I, and I do think most coaches get into the game, will, they'll tell you that they got in because they love basketball and love being around kids, but hardly anybody stays in the game for that reason, and I think that's what happens to Steve Pytel in Make It, Take It, is he's very much at a crossroads uh, and trying to decide what to do next um, and I think you know as, as fiction writers we always want to get our characters into situations where they have to make a choice and neither choice is a good choice and um, and the, the kind of show that the world is a complicated place I think that most I think that Steve Vitell is very true although he's not entirely based on me but the, you know the guy who gets into the business for one reason and then he's stuck in the business and doesn't know what else to do you know a lot of coaches are pretty there's some talented guys in coaching, but most of them are very sort of limited in, in their uh, focus in life and that kind of thing. So I wanted to sort of depict that kind of uh, uh, obsession that you know the, the people involved in the business have. Do you also picture the limitation right alongside of it Do when I, you say you said I wanted to picture that? Uh, um, Obsession, but do you also picture the limitations? Well, I, think, I think so. I, yeah. think, I think you know. There's con in college basketball. There's constantly ethical questions to be to be dealt with. Just because of the nature of it, you've got a situation where you're giving kids free educations because they can put a round ball and a round hoop, and you're going to make the guy who directs the kids to do that the highest paid person on the campus. And right. it's it's a strange system, <laughs> and no one no one is innocent. But to me, no one is totally guilty either. And 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 that, to me, that makes for a better story. And, and I, I do think people have a, a, an interest in what's going on behind the scenes. You know, the, there's a 24-hour news cycle, but we just saw what happened at Penn State with the football scandal and Notre Dame with the strange uh, girlfriend 
story. It's not exactly a scandal. Hey, be careful I'm what a, you say. He might be coming to Chicago. Yeah. But 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 uh, I wanted to say I just want to interrupt. I am a Notre Dame grad. I'll be careful. And a domer. Oh, many no. of us had imaginary girlfriends, <laughs> <laughs> especially before we started letting women into the school. I, I could talk to you about being unloaded from a bus in in February at Notre Dame, a bus full of women surrounded by a bunch of men who were setting aside their pretend girlfriend for the moment. Yeah. Trying to. It was if scary. If the Mundelein girls would just give them a break. I know. But we didn't. We just played poker all night. Well, the, but the point is, if I can remember the point, yeah. the, the point is uh, that, that even with the 24-hour news cycle, we really had no idea what was going on at Penn State or Notre Dame. And, exactly. And so that's, I, I, and I remember this feeling from coaching where you'd go to the bar after the game. I often went to a bar after the game, and people want to know what really happened at halftime, or what did the coach say in that timeout, or what happened when that kid threw, you know, pushed the other guy, and uh, people want to know what really happened, and I think that's our fascination with the news. And uh, but it's gotten more and more, you know, difficult to really get behind the scenes. I think because of this uh, the odd twist that journalism has taken in the last ten years. Huh? Really? So you think it's harder to get behind the I scenes? I do. I, th I think you know the to, to me uh, the best journalist I know is John Conroy, a sh the Chicago journalist who uncovered the police torture scandal and right. he can't get a job. But if he would just blog, if he'd take thirty seconds to blog and tweet every day, he'd be you know he'd be the king of Chicago media. But because he wants to get it at, at a richer story like like Mike did with Ramblers. Right. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to you know. I, I don't want to disappoint anyone. Any. Uh, Possible writers out there, but we're not. You don't. We're, I don't think Mike's going to get rich from Ramblers unless the movie gets made, which would be 